have the floor. I okay. have the floor. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Hi. So, good morning. Um, my name is Katarina Farinha, and I'm here representing Embevel and the work that uh, my colleagues and I did, and it's called Searching for Cometinho, the little metric that could. And no, the title is not incomplete. It was actually inspired by um, kind of a joke that is this little children's book that is the little engine that could. <laughs> it's about a little engine that is able to perform as well as uh, a bigger one, engine. So we already have a sense of how this uh, talk will be about. But starting with the agenda, I'm going to start by motivating why we should work in this type um, of research. Then I'm going to show you some methods on how we do a faster, better inference. What is um, ah, okay? Um, some methods that we use to do encoder pruning. Then some techniques for knowledge distillation that probably you are also aware. And um, what is the impact of these new metrics, these new models on correlations with human judgments? And I'm going to leave you with some take-home message. All of us that are here in this room know that large pre-trained language models are here to stay. Why? Because they are achieving uh, state-of-the-art results in several tasks, but they have a big problem, and is that it, they have uh, astonishing sizes. And here I'm having a picture that I took from uh, state-of-the-art report in 2020, and we could already see that uh, the models that were um, but recent at the time, we're already having billions of parameters. Of course, we can have like GPT-3 as 175 billion parameters, but from them until now, many others have this amount of sizes and amount of parameters. So we definitely need to have lighter and more energy efficient models to deal with the tasks that we are dealing in NLP and in other tasks. In this paper, we used our recent um, state-of-the-art metric for MT evaluation comet as a use case, but actually the methods that I'm going to explain to you can be generalized to other tasks and other types of models. Metrics for MT evaluation are also getting bigger, like I said. Why? Because the state-of-the-art metrics for MT evaluation, and now more and more the standard, are also based in large pre-trained models. And I took this image from uh, the results of last year's shared task for metrics in 2021, where we could already see that uh, the top ones, all of them, are based on these last pre-trained models. So these were the, the models and the metrics that actually won most of the language pairs at the time, actually performing much better than the, w the ones that are, are the most used, like Blur and CHRF, that are used because they are light and has been used for several years. So even though they have the high correlations, again, I'm going to stress that they have this problem. They are huge. So we also face with a responsible AI problem because at, the, at some point, if we are getting get bigger and bigger in the models, only the corporatives and the companies that have the computational power to use these kind of models are the ones that are going to actually continue doing the experiments and having the better models and using them also in production. But Comet is no exception. So we developed Comet, it's a state-of-the-art metric, but we are aware that we are using XML large as an encoder. And this encoder has uh, 560 million parameters. So I'm putting here the architecture. So just um, like a brief summary of how Comet works. We have uh, as input three. So other metrics only use two inputs, the reference and the source. We also, uh, the reference and the translation, so the hypothesis that we want to measure the quality on. But in Comet, we also use the source. And uh, we input, input them and we encode using the XLMR large model, and then we do average pooling with some clever combination of the embeddings that we get, and then we pass it to a feedforward layer where we do a regression task to get a score. And this score is the score that is a comet score, that is a score that's going to tell us how good the translation is. And Comet has been widely validated. So not only has been one of the top metrics in 2020 shared task metrics, but also 2021. 
Here I'm having a print screen of 2021 shared task where uh, it says that it was one of the top uh, metrics. Also, actually, along with our Comet uh, Kiwi metric, so it's a metric that um, doesn't use reference. But also in other, in other type of works, for example, I'm uh, highlighting here a paper from Tom and all uh, from the Microsoft group where they uh, compared where they do a deep analysis of models that, um, that they want to deploy or not. So actually the title is to ship or not to ship. And the idea is to compare the model that is already deployed and a new model and which automatic metric should be used in this type of scenario. And uh, they saw, they highlighted Comet and actually again Comet source, that is the Comet QE as being the top metrics. So, um, what we thought was, uh, okay, but since the encoder is actually the biggest part of our models, can we make the, the comment lighter just by changing the encoder? So let's just try to the same type of, method of training method, but using a decoder that is much lighter than XML Huberta Large. And so we did it. We tried uh, last year share task. So one of the submissions was this Cometinho, the first version of Cometinho that we tried. And instead of using the XLMR large, we used a uh, distilled version of it. It was introduced by Wang in 2020 and actually only accounts for 20% of the parameters. So we already had a good reduction here. The problem was that we were not very happy with how it performs. So um, I'm putting you here two of the language pairs that were analyzed in last year's share task. And uh, we can see that our Comet EA was the top metric in those language pairs, but committing ODA DA actually drops quite far. So, um, especially for example, if you look to low resource language pairs, we thought that uh, we needed to do something uh, more clever about it and try other metrics to, to be lighter, but to be as good as Comet or close to that. So this is was this was the question that we faced. So how can we make Comet faster and lighter without losing this drop in performance? And I'm going to talk about, uh, to you about uh, three different methods. One is actually just making it faster because the time that we take to have the Comet scores can also be a limitation. For example, for some of these cases I'm going to, s to tell you about, but uh, in like in production uh, scenarios where you want to be faster. Then I'm going to talk about some of the techniques that we did to prune the encoder, either by removing layers or actually some of the weights to put it lighter. And then some uh, typical knowledge distillation techniques where you have a, student, uh, a bigger teacher that is going to teach a smaller student, a smaller so let's start with the faster inference and some basic uh, tricks that you can do to make the model faster at decoding time. So a very simple solution, but actually can be very useful when you have large test sets, is actually just doing a batch uh, length sorting. So the basic idea is if uh, when you are doing the batch, if you group them by the length of the segments, you will save a lot of padding tokens. And saving a lot of padding tokens will obviously save computational time and make the model faster. And to show that, I'm putting you here a basic experiment that we did where we varied the test set size from 1,000 to 5,000. And just with this simple trick, we could already save uh, quite uh, a decent amount of time getting Comet scores. Time in seconds. Another simple thing that uh, Comet may uh, allow us to do is caching the embeddings. And where, where, what kind of scenarios this is useful? Is where you have repetitions of things that you are using to have the Comet scores. For example, where you are comparing multiple systems on the same test set. That is actually a common practice when you are in the production mode and you are, for example, comparing several new models with the one that is in production. So on the same test set because you want values to be comparable. So you have the same source, the same references, and then the apostles are the ones who, who that is changing. So this is one scenario where catching the embeddings can be useful. The 
the other the other scenario is uh, for example if you want to use minimal base risk decoding and here i'm already giving some advertisement to our quartz project paper that is going to be in this conference so number 17 where we talk just about these and how we are trying to address the problem and also uh, in our upcoming NECO paper of 2022. But why is it so important in this scenario as well? Because at the, uh, in the decoding, uh, when using minimal base risk decoding, you have a complexity of one square, where n is the number of hypotheses, because they follow the rule of consensus decoding, where you compare each of the hypotheses with all the others. So if you have a way of uh, caching the embeddings, you can already see that will be very useful in this scenario as well. And Comet is a perfect metric to do that, actually, because of its, its architecture, because we are encoding the three inputs separately. So we can make use of, uh, when we are comparing multiple systems, again, make use of the source and the reference, and EMBR, for example, more important to cache the translations. And because uh, the is very important to compare multiple systems, to see if we want to deploy or not a new model, um, I'm, uh, here I have a plot that's uh, similar to the one that I, I showed you before, but where we were um, comparing uh, one up to eight systems and to see what was the impact on the decoding time with caching or no caching. And obviously, the more models you are comparing, the better that uh, improvement uh, will be, the more useful. Talking about encoder pruning. So um, our encoder model, the XLMR Roberta Large, have 25 layers. So one thing that uh, we can see is what is the, the normalized weight, so the weights of each of the layer that comments learn when uh, we teach the, the task. And um, we can see that uh, the top ones start to having lower and lower weights. And these are the ones that uh, we might that we want to prune without, because if you prune the top layers, then we are not going to affect the other ones, the deeper ones that actually the ones that contributed more to the empty evaluation task. But more important than looking to the normalized weights of each layer is actually to see if we prune what is the impact in our correlations. And here we use the dev set from uh, Matrix uh, Share Task 2020. And, uh, we started and um, we started by removing the layers and we saw the impact on the candlestick correlation. So this is a common practice when we are developing new metrics for MT evaluation. And uh, what we saw and what you can see is that uh, the correlation only starts decreasing when we reduce more than when we prune more than five layers. So we wanted to be conservative because the whole idea is to not decrease the, the performance of the new metric of new, the new cometinu, and we decided to remove the top five, and that accounts for 10% of the model's parameters reduction. So now we have our model with 20 layers, but each of these layers is actually composed by a feedforward layer or feedforward block and a self-attention block. And this feedforward block has 4,092 parameters and the self-attention block has 16 self-attention heads. So it's already quite a lot. And the other thing that we can see is, can we prune? Can we do something about this? So we use the same strategy. So we start reducing the feed forward size and we checked what was the impact on the correlations. So as you can see here, we have the same test set and the, the decrease in the candle tau correlation. And again, we were trying to be conservative. So we decided to decrease one quarter of the feed forward size. Regarding the self-attention heads, Again, the same reasoning. We decided to only t take two of the self-attention heads. So we end up with 14 self-attention heads in our model. So we end up with the first version of cometing that I want to tell you about, that is prune comet. So this model has 80% of the parameters. We removed uh, five of the top layers. We removed the, self, uh, the feed forward hidden size, size to three quarters, and uh, we have 14 self-attention heads. 
out of the six scenes. Regarding knowledge distillation, this will be the distilled comet uh, version of the comet. And um, like probably you are aware, in this scenario, you have a big teacher that's going to teach a small student. And our big teacher is actually an ensemble model of five different comet models that were trained with different seeds. And this model was already introduced before by Gluskov in 2021. So we, make, we made use of it. We took and labeled data 25 million sentence pairs from the opus corpus uh, for a total of 15 uh, language pairs. With this, we first do a bi cleaner method to, to get only the sentence pairs that have good quality. And then we do some kind of data augmentation. So we took a bilingual model from Hagging Face and we translate with that model all the, the source sentences to have translations with high quality. And we do the same, but using a pivoting model. And here we were trying to have translations with lower sentences, with lower quality. So we end up with 45 million tuples with source translation references and source uh, and score, where the score is the score from uh, the teacher model. Again, our student here is this distilled version of Excel Marroverte that we used previously on the uh, last year share test that I just told you about in the beginning. So the model that uh, only has 20% of the parameters of the Roberta Large. So checking the impacts on correlations. So um, the comet practice when developing and testing metrics is to see well, how is the correlation with human judgment, like Kendall Tau or Pearson correlation, like we saw before. And there are two types of hum human judgments that uh, normally we care about. The first one uh, is direct assessment. And uh, when doing direct assessment, the annotator is facing with a scenario, for example, like the one that I'm showing you here, where you have a source sentences, you have the translation, and they are asked to score between 1 and 100. How is the general quality of that translation? But obviously, it can be a little bit subjective, especially when the only metric that you are getting is a score, as absolute score. So what has been done already for some years in the shared tasks is actually to translate this direct assessment into relative direct assessments. So basically, to compare hypotheses in pairs. So for example, here we have a source, we have a reference, and we have several hypotheses that were probably sub that were submissions for shared task. And for example, if you compare the first two, the first is obviously has a zero, so it's the worst hypothesis and the second is the better hypothesis. If we compare the second and the last one, the, the second is still the better hypothesis and the last the worse. But when compared the first and the last one, now the last is the better hypothesis because we're comparing with one that has zero. So just to give you a, a basic idea of what is uh, direct assessment relative height. But what we use at Embebel and what is becoming now the standard is actually using multidimensional quality metrics, in short, MQM. And why it is important? Because it's a much more fine grain type of annotation that annotators can do when we asked for MT evaluation. So uh, this is a typical scenario. We have, uh, like again, a source in Portuguese in this case and uh, where, uh, the translation in English. And the editors, uh, the annotators, not only need to say uh, where is the error, but also the, the, the category of it and the severity. So for example, in the, second in the second segment, we have a missing punctuation, and this missing punctuation is not that important. So that's why it is like a minor category, so in green. But if you look to the last segment, we have a typo in the source segments that is tete. It actually doesn't mean anything in Portuguese. And this gave, uh, this led to an hallucination in the target uh, uh, sentence, so in the hypothesis, tete. That also doesn't mean anything. And then the sentence become a little bit like incomprehensible. So this is a critical mistake. It's something that we really want to avoid and should have a, a higher weight when um, computing uh, the quality score. And to compute this quality score, we can have 
slightly different uh, ways of it. At Embed, we use the one that I have on the left, but uh, on the right, we use the one that, uh, micro, uh, that Google introduced last year. But the whole idea is that it's a weighted sum of the number of errors and their severities. And uh, again, it's becoming the common practice and becoming the standard in WMT shared tasks. And briefly, I just uh, took this uh, plot from uh, a Google paper from 2021, where you can already see that the correlations with the high performance metrics are much higher for uh, when the, we are comparing with MQM scores than with direct assessments. So the ones that, uh, that were the common practice in WMT. Now looking the to the impact of our models, our prune models and our distilled models in the, our test set. And here the test set is the Matrix WMT 2021 test set. So prune comet has 80% of the parameters and has a speed improvement of 37%. And the distilled common has only 20% of the parameters and 50% of speed improvement. And uh, what we can see is that the performance is not big as we wanted, and actually both of them are with higher performance than BLUS, CHRF, and BERT score, which is was really nice. Now, in the second set uh, of um, correlations that we took, because these ones are with MQM, the, the, the previous ones were the right assessment, again, the same reasoning. So um, the models are the same and the correlations don't drop. So we were able to perform almost as good as our Comet model and better than normal metrics, much better than normal metrics like BLUS, CHRF, BERT score, and uh, PRISM here. So PRIM, PRISM. Yeah. Some uh, take a home message in a way of like conclusions. Um, batching and caching that are simple tricks can make uh, a big impact or significant impact in inference time, especially in the scenarios where we have like the repetitions. Pruning and distillation can significantly reduce the number of the parameters, making it faster, more efficient, uh, uh, energy efficient, and at, uh, uh, with a small cost in performance. And this can open new cases like incorporating methods into the coding time and training time. But again, what I want to, to that you take home message is that we should do this for all other tasks and other types of models and um, tasks because otherwise it's just getting bigger and bigger and we need to deal something about uh, um, costs that our models are having. You can check uh, and I incentivize you to check our GitHub page where you can have these models of Cometinho but all the other models of Comet, so also the bigger ones that are which we are trying to be a uh, common practice. Thank you, and if you have some questions, I'm open to. Um, thank you, Katarina, for the presentation. That's, uh, that was a very nice talk. Any questions? Ah, yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, sorry if I missed, but when you were doing like the major critical errors, yeah, that one, uh, what's the inter-annotator agreement for that? Like how much your um, annotators agree what is a major and what is critical? Yeah, that's a good point. And in, in, in the Babel is something that uh, we are always trying to check because obviously um, people can differ of if they think it's a major or a minor. But when you have, for example, the categories, for example, here is untranslated, but it could be like hallucination, that is already have like a default severity. So that most of the cases will be a critical. Of course, the annotator can change and not think that is um, a critical, but in the most, um, for example, in these ones, that is like very obviously that it, it changed the meaning of the sentence, so people probably will not understand what it is. We have a high annotator agreement. But like it's obvious, sorry, it's, it's obvious for a few people, but like, for example, when I look at the translation into English, I don't think it's a very big deal. Like, I, I'm a Portuguese native speaker, so I think it's understandable. So like, how do you deal with uh, translators disagreeing 
on the major and critical so you can have the, the weights that you need for your, for your metric? Yeah, I uh, understand the question. So we are, we are trying several methods. We can be more conservative and, and getting the, the one that is the more punishment if we want to have our metrics to have always like the lower score to be on the safe side. But if we have multiple annotations for the same segment, we can do, for example, majority voting um, and try to do like an average of all the annotations. I'm really sorry. We are, we uh, are, doing, we are doing yeah. a, a, a research and on how to deal with the annotator agreement. It's something okay. that's... Uh, but what's the annotator agreement that you have right now? That we have right now? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't want to say anything wrong, but it's about... And we have uh, uh, someone there that you can uh, talk all about uh, MQM framework, but I think it should be around 0.5 Pearson. Uh, okay. Thanks. No problem. Thank you. Um, uh, other questions? Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so you, uh, most of these uh, mm, uh, neural-based uh, metrics, which are ba they're basically trying to uh, trying to track human judgments. But then, the, what's uh, so? There's a, there's something behind that. Is what's the correlation of human judgments with respect to actual performance in tasks of the machine translation system? So, for example, post-editing effort, or uh, how much people buy your product because the machine translated uh, description is bad or, or good. So, with the, uh, are, with we, are we trying to overdo? My question is very philo philosophical: Is that are yeah. we trying to overdo correlation with something that maybe doesn't have a very good correlation with the actual intended applications of machine translation? Um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> a more philosophical one that I was expecting. Um, we are not measuring. We are not measuring or uh, correlating the impact, for example, with Comet scores. With if we sell more translations, so that will be the impact of if we have less complaints. But we are we are making a big effort to try to translate our Comet scores into some um, poor analysis with some, for example, colors that our clients can see to make sure that they are satisfied with the product with the translations that we are giving. And in that sense, if we make sure that these actually translate in something that our clients can look and be comfortable, I think that then we are correlating with uh, less complaints or um, more uh, uh, clients. But you're just trusting that this will happen. So you we don't keep have, you track. Don't have any hard data? I mean, I don't think I'm not sure, but there's no hard data yet supporting the correlation of DA and MQM with, with actual uh, measured performance of machine translation. So if you're trying to correlate it too much, maybe your target is too fuzzy. It's not, so the target behind is the one you want, but I know that's difficult. No, I understand because for example, maybe instead of having like high correlation with human judgment, probably what will be like in more practical, it will be just to avoid having criticals or to avoid having uh, like very bad translations because that, those are the ones that clients care more about. That's why we, we tend to be on the safe side um, when doing that, but yeah, like there are two different things that we can uh, try to uh, uh, try to correlate. Um, I understand your point. Thanks. Maybe Andrea wants to add something on. Just, just to, to to add a little bit to that point, and this was a great question. Um, so uh, you know, th these methods that Katrin is presenting here, Comet, uh, the original Comet, and the, this uh, lighter version, Cometinu they can be trained on whatever uh, metric we have, right? So if you have any signal, anything that tells you, uh, you know, the goodness of a translation for, uh, you know, according to something downstream, you can also do regression on that. So it's very orthogonal to the method presented here. But indeed, I think uh, MQM is like a, a first step into looking at the translation quality from a perspective that, uh, you know, it might be more business oriented, let's say. If, if, you, if you need, uh, you know, if there are some things that are critical for a certain content type, you can specify that in the MKM topology, but of course it doesn't finish the story, right? Uh, yeah. Thank you. There is another question here. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, would you ever look into developing a met uh, um, an evaluation metric for document level translation? 
We are actually now trying to do that. So one thing Thanks. that um, we need is a good corpus to use. So uh, actually now recently, uh, also in the shared task, we are making an effort to have like at a at document level and have a proper corpus to develop Comet. But um, we also have a, a PhD student working on that okay. with Comet. Okay, so we thank hope you to much. have that something soon. Thanks. Oh. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, when you were do showing this still bird, I just wonder why did you use 20% of the parameters or did you did you check, was it just like a magic number? 20% of the yeah. parameters we checked, but the model. But you did, yeah. I just wanted to know like when does the performance start dropping if, if you have 20, 30, 40% of the parameters uh, at we distillation did, yeah. time? Yeah, for the twenty percent of the parameters, we're talking about the distill version. So we exactly. use yeah, we used the the model that was introduced by Wang twenty twenty. So we didn't check to like if it a model with thirty percent of the parameters, sixty percent. We didn't check that. It's an ongoing work, so maybe there is a, a, a better sweet spot with uh, less yeah. weight and more pr and performance like on pair with Comet. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, I was just shocked that. The two models we, we did. We did. We did. Yeah, we did many more uh, when we were doing like the prune comet with how many layers to remove, ho how was the weight. But for the the steel version, we tried with different data, but we used the encoder that uh, was introduced by Wang. With that one with the twenty percent. So the the steel version. So in that sense, we didn't change uh, more. Other questions? Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I have a more practical question about this caching. I like the caching approach. And I was thinking that maybe you could even uh, go further and then say that this kind of uh, evaluation would be a service and not just a, 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 a tool that you just ship around and you could uh, optimize that caching even more because then it's always going to the same server. You can cache as much as you, as you want. Would that be a thing that you consider? Yes, sir. And on the other, uh, also related to that, uh, could, you, could you also ship some, some of the embeddings with the test set instead of um, caching them only? But um, I mean, test sets could have, for example, for the source and the references, the embeddings really? shipped together with the test set. Is that something that you want to do? Yeah, definitely we, we, sh we will want to, uh, to work on that as well. Especially at an Mabel, like I said, we want to save computational power. And we most of the times we have a test set or a static test set and some test set that is seasonal, so we change. Um, so it, that would be a good idea to also chip some of the embeddings to try to save time. Thank you. Another question? Yeah, one. <laughs> I would say one uh, last question before we go for coffee break. Thank you. Um, I just thought of one more question, and apologies if it, if it doesn't make sense, but I'll oh try. No. Um, so you showed that you, you've sort of made Comet a little bit smaller, and the performance drops a little bit. Um, well, so with, the, with the distilled Comet, it's actually much smaller. It's 80, only 20% of the parameters. OK. Um, but it did, it did have a bigger performance drop than the other, um, than prudent comment, right? Um, yeah, so my, my point, I guess, is what would be the practical um, implication of this? Because I can imagine in a shared task, for example, you would still use comment because it still has better performance than the other metrics. And in a shared task, you presumably have the resources to do that, right? Uh, but then, you know, ultimately, when I don't know, I guess, I guess this could be useful for deployment. No, it's useful for, for the, the other scenarios that I just told you about. For example, minimal based uh, VST coding, like there, where you, or where you have there, if you are comparing, uh, like you are doing many combinations, many comparisons. We don't want like a metric uh, that is very heavy and takes a lot of time and more computational power. So there are many scenarios when having a metric that is much lighter. Actually, it, it is more favorable at the cost of a small drop in performance. Okay. So in the scenario like the shared task, if your optimization is just win for win, mm -hmm. okay, maybe you will use a heavy model. But even that, like with models being so big, at some point only the big corporations that allows to have uh, and have the resources for that will use. So it's something that uh, everyone should try to swift and have uh, like the steel versions and lighter versions. Okay. Okay, thank you. I don't know if uh, you were No, that does answer my question, yes. So okay. there are many scenarios uh, where you should have uh, yeah. lighter uh, 
models. And although here, yes, we have a slight uh, decrease in performance, looking to the correlations, maybe in practice they are not that important. Maybe in practice yeah. the, the, the cost uh, and the time that we are saving yeah. would be more relevant. Yeah. I guess then, um, hmm. what, would, um, what would be a next step for you then? Would, would you be looking into making them even smaller? Or would you be looking into developing some, because Comet has quite a rigid idea behind it. Well, rigid, I mean, if you, you, you can either com come up with a completely different metric and then also neural based probably and try to make it a little bit smaller or you can build a bigger Comet. I, I'm just not sure what the next steps. I think the next step is uh, try to have Comet faster. Because for example, all of these metrics are still much slower than blur. So it's often um, a criticism that we have for a train or, ba or metrics based on large speed train models. Yeah. So um, it's working on this direction, having even lighter and performance, maybe even better than the, the comet that we are, we, we are showing here. That is our baseline. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, I guess we uh, will wrap up the session. Thank you, uh, thanks to the speakers. Um, and to you all.